Good evening. Welcome to the Lemore City Commission meeting for December 6, 2016. This evening we have seven items on the agenda, five of which is for study, and two which will be a special session. So we'll begin with number one is to review the recreational vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you said, this topic is a recreational vehicle parking. This is something that comes up every so often, and we have had a request from a resident to bring this forward, um, and the commission decided to bring this to a study session, so that's why we're hearing it. Um, currently, our regulations only allow people to park their RVs, which would include boats, campers, trailers, um, those types of, of things. They're only allowed to park those um, outside of their front or side yard setbacks, so closest to the house um, for up to 72 hours per month. They can be parked in the rear yard with no time limit. Um, in August, the commission reviewed this and had voted to increase that time period to 96 hours per month. That just hasn't been incorporated by ordinance yet. Um, and knowing that this was coming up, we decided to just kind of hold off and see how this was going. Um, so really, we're just bringing it for your discussion to see if there's any changes that you want to make. I believe that the resident who had originally brought this up most recently is here. I did pull some regulations from um, surrounding cities in the area and just generally either RVs are not allowed to be parked in residential properties in the front or side yard um, or they're limited in the number that are allowed if they are allowed. Um, I didn't find any other cities that limit it based on a certain number of hours per month. Mm -hmm. And I will say that from an enforcement standpoint, that is rather difficult to enforce when it's a, a certain number of hours per month. So right. um, the, yeah, the examples from the other cities are in there. Um, and I can answer any questions you might have. And if you wanted to hear from that resident as well. The uh, Mr. Commission, have anything you want to say about it to start with? Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, first night, for the, the RVs and the boats, uh, this is not talking about the sea dudes that's on a trailer, but I think it's more trailer than the others. Uh, I would like to see an extended time period, like from March or April to October for six months or a period, that they can set if they have to, because if they're not, they're paying storage fees on that. Mm -hmm. They're also paying taxes on it. They're paying license on it. They're paying insurance on it. So why do we want to burden the owners? Because they are in a position to own a, uh, an RV. Uh, it seems to me like they're being punished and uh, The ones on the north side of the street in the old part of Lemmore, now they have access to the backyard and side yard. <coughs> You go into the new additions on the other side of limit, they don't. And I think this is where you'll see a lot of them, especially around 20th Street, off of 20th and those new streets there. There's quite a few people that own motor homes there. And you know, to get it and keep track on it or play the game with 72 hours and then move it real quick and then bring it back the next month, I think is a big hassle that the people don't need. That's my opinion. And I know that a lot of those places south, um, the homeowners associations have very specific rules right. um, that are that would be enforced, but they would be independent of the right. city, that, obviously. That would take precedence over ours right. at home. Well, I don't know. I, it's on the other side of that too. Um, you're you're not you're saying for RVs and boats. Yeah. Okay. An RV is a very large vehicle, and if you do not have a lot of yard, and 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 I, I is, you know, you say you mentioned the Northeast area, things are very tight and very compact there, that there there is no side yard in a lot of them. So it is the backyard, and they are allowed to park it in the backyard mm -hmm. if there's a paved surface. But um, I don't agree, and and I know that. The citizens that I've heard from too, it's when people do object is when it's in the front yard or the or the side yard for an extended period of time. It's especially when they get complaints is when um, there's not a lot of space 
they're ready to they're looking to sell their house or something like that on the market uh, or they just they generally don't like it but a lot of my complaints come when the realtor comes and says well what about that over there you need to ask them to get rid of that because that's not helping the appearance of the neighborhood type of thing so if you have a recreation vehicle on a boat you don't have those type of qualms and that obviously because that's that's a fun thing for you to have but if you're in a tighter space, and I live in an older area where there's no side yards, you know, it's it's the back or the front, and those are the options on that. For most people, it's it's the back on that. So I don't know if it's really fair to generalize that and have that constantly there throughout the summer when you're also out there. That would be the view of my well, well, sitting in my backyard is looking at someone's RV. If they, if they have an RV and they plan yeah. It's going to be there more than 72 hours or they get it ready and then they leave on the trip. They and they come, come back, back yeah. Month. That's if they that do that. Could, you yeah, could you could yeah. have it sitting there for two or three you months or something like that. Months, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I just, yeah. I, but that's better than having them set up north on our streets. We've got three or four of them. No, and I don't, I don't really, yeah. And I don't really like them. I don't like them on the street. I definitely don't like that. And I, um, but if, they, like I said, if there is a, they're still meeting the setbacks on the side of the street there. And they can have it there as storage, as long as they meet that six foot setback. You mean on the side of the house? On the side of the house. Yeah, I mean, that is, it entails putting in a hard surface. Mm -hmm. Parking area park is another expense. Mm -hmm. Why do we want to keep throwing expenses at these people that have RVs, which are mostly basically new ones. They cost more than the average house do. Yeah, that's uh, true. They're not, they're not paupers, nor they, they run in the slums. If it doesn't encroach on the sidewalk, if it's long enough, they have a long enough drive to put it in, but it doesn't cover the sidewalk to make it impassable, mm -hmm. I don't see a thing wrong with it. I, for a lot of people, it's not very attractive to, to stare at that day in and day out in the front of their neighbor's yard. I mean, yeah, you're, they don't own that ground. The people that own the RV own that ground. Mm -hmm. Now, where's their rights at? I know. I, yeah. And I, I, I am. I, but that's, but you know, but those are the majority of the planes come in where they're staring at it for, you know, it's, the, the I, I think there's a there. compromise for both. And that's why I think for a limited amount of time, you know, give that occupant across the street a, a rest to look at it. It's not. It's not an easy. It's not. A, it's not an easy solution. It's the same thing as having yard art in your yard and stuff like that. It's a very personal thing. I understand that. You know, and and, I, and it's not even like it's an economics choice or anything like that. It's a lifestyle's choice. You either like to camp in RV. Not everybody does, but not everybody wants that constantly in you know across the street center those th that's those are the calls that I get and 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 I tell you the when someone looks to sell their house and if a neighbor on the street has something like that that that's when we've got the most vigorous complaints on that well, I um, well, I'd like to hear from the resident here that brought this before us before mm -hmm. he's got some other input for us but I think it's just so difficult to enforce that 72 hour thing yeah. if you look around it's like I said before, when I looked at his house on Google, I saw I saw these RVs in the neighbor's yards. You know, all I, he's got a, he lives, and, everybody and who has an RV needs to live in that neighborhood. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. that's the truth. So, I know, I mean, yeah. But uh, not yeah. Being, not being enforced. And I don't know, um, I noticed in some of these others, it talks about the numbers of vehicles, of those type of vehicles. and. I don't really see anything that talks about the size of the vehicles, but yeah, um, I was surprised. You know, so if it's blocking the view of the street, then you know that's an issue too. But yeah. I would really like to hear from him before we discuss it in I, know, I, I was surprised about the number. How many people would have two RVs? How many? I was surprised that people address the number of vehicles. How many people have two RVs? Well, a lot of people have an RV and, yeah, and a boat and, boat and stuff like that. No, I'm just kidding, but yeah, you know, it's yeah. just like. Yeah. And a lot of them have three car garages, so they have. And some have other trailers mm -hmm. and stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. uh, yeah, after thinking about this since the last time it came through, um, I've always been the type of person that if we have laws on the books, they need to be enforced, and if they can't, shouldn't be enforced, take them off the book. When it comes to enforcement, 
well, you're talking 46 hours, 72 hours, 96, that's, it's almost impossible to enforce it. it. It really is. Unless you have code enforcement there, clocking it, tightening it, it's, it's almost impossible to do that. So on that end of it, um, it has no teeth to enforce uh, uh, an hourly like that. Uh, me being a, someone who's owned a boat and owned an RV in the past, um, I tend to agree with uh, the mayor on this where we should set a uh, March 1st, April 1st, whatever, into the fall. And as long as nobody is living in the RV, because I think that's the main thing we're talking about. Because uh, to me, this thing is either put up going to be for aesthetic or for the purpose of people stopping people from living in these things out in front of homes and all that. And uh, so uh, as long as people are living in these things, I don't have a problem with them staying out in front of my personal mm -hmm. property. Um, and as far as the evaluation on property when people are selling homes and all that, I can understand that. But at the same time, an RV is something that's going to be moved once the owner moves out anyway. I mean, it's their home, they're selling it, they'll take the RV with them. So um, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Mayor, on that. Uh, I think we should go with the summertime from spring to fall, let them park one RV, one boat, and as long as nobody is living in the RV during those months, I think we're fine. This is the person that generated the study session? Yes, sir. Come on up at the podium. Uh, let us have your name and your address. And yes, sir. Tell us what's on your mind. Okay. My name's uh, Mike Pednars. I, li <laughs> I live at 2410 South 24th Street, Leavenworth, Kansas. Right. I'm not as nervous today, so. Um, but I want to give you guys, I, I did go around and I, I got a petition with a couple of recommendations to, um, to change it. And you guys hit on a couple of my recommendations. Um, one of them, and I've talked to, and to, to address the other commissioner, I don't know what her name is, Lisa? Yeah. Address Lisa's concerns. I've mm -hmm. talked to a lot of big RV owners when I got these signatures and uh, they were had no problem you know signing this even though it, it didn't reply to the big 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 RV owners they still will store their stuff their biggest concern was don't block the street you know mm -hmm. because you got kids in the neighborhood so that all was a you know factor but having said that I mean I only had two hours a night for one week and I got 52 signatures on there um, Nobody denied to sign it, and two of my options on that form was let the residents park their RV or small boats or trailers less than 17 feet in length, about the size of a regular pickup truck or bigger was one option, and to just let them park it in their driveway throughout the year. The other option was the same thing, same size restriction and everything, but from what you stated, April through October. Mm -hmm. So, and like I said, I when I went around for signatures, <coughs> not one person, you know, denied wanting to sign that. They they the smaller ones, but not the huge long recreational RVs. Right. The, the the code that I that I put on there, the code it stays exactly the same as you got it. You might want to take out the 72 hours because you can't really enforce that. That was a good point because I don't know how somebody would tag somebody. <laughs> How do you know if it was there for five hours, you know, when they came over? But minus the 72 hours piece, you would add in a size restriction that can be parked mm -hmm. in the driveway, per se, in the front. Everything else still applies to the back and the side. You can still keep that in there and just put a size restriction because it's pretty, you know, 17 feet is about, about the size of a regular pickup truck or maybe a little bit bigger mm -hmm. type, you know, you know, you may go 20 feet. Because then the people with the pickup trucks with a little camper thing over the top would be eligible to park their cars in the, in, I mean, park it in the driveway too. You know, whether it's for that period of time or for just permanently, you know. So, but going around, and if I had more time, I probably could have got a thousand signatures, but I only had two hours a night for one week. So, um, and that's, so hopefully you guys take a look at that because it, I mean, everybody I've talked to, you know, especially with the little towing trailer stuff, them guys too they use that daily you know mm -hmm. and to have to you know 72 hours is just not realistic mm -hmm. so well, well, I, well and i we had a trailer though and we only like and when we did for all in antiques so and believe me anybody who didn't like it called and said how long is that going to be out there so i've had to kind of deal with that type of thing too personally and and, and, yeah. and i understand but most yeah. of the people that i've talked to that's complained yeah before they complained because somebody else got cited they got cited and somebody else didn't yeah. that's, that's what it come down to right yeah it was the it was a matter of being they complained because yeah. 
they were they got cited and the person two doors down didn't yeah, and that's why that, and that, that is, was one of their complaints well, that is aggravating so yeah well to add to what you were saying is you pretty well restricted the rvs by saying 20 feet and i agree with the synopsis of not blocking the sidewalk however if you have a driveway you have enough setback on your house <coughs> that you can handle a 40 foot motor home correct which you can out south then that should be legal. And, and and i agree and i as long as you know it doesn't interfere right. i mean the the petition has options you know for you guys to whatever comes best mm -hmm. but the bottom line is i mean you sh you should be able to park you know smaller items that don't block anything in your driveway like that um and i i, I I mean, I've seen yard art. What you mentioned, somebody mentioned yard art. It's a person. You know, it's a I mean, yeah. I mean, a covered, nice-looking boat in my driveway, as opposed to a toilet in the front yard filled with potting soil in a plant, is called yard art, and it looks good. So, I, you know, call it what it is, but uh, uh, <laughs> crazy some some stuff. But uh, my whole thing is, is I think you can tweak it. These were just a couple of options that mm -hmm. are on the code. I mean, it could be tweaked to. If it don't, just like you said, if it doesn't interfere with the, you know, because one resident did mention that. If you park it on the side of the street, he couldn't see the cars coming down with kids. Right. Yeah. yeah, but if it's in his driveway, you know, I know somebody, These a lot of people in the area have huge drivers. I could fit four cargo vans in my driveway. Well, yeah. And, and you can still put it all the way up to the front, and you can see easily. And so. that's hard, because I've, you know, we have properties that they can barely fit the car there, and then you've got someone that can probably have a used car lot right there on their own property there because they have so much space so, so I, I think I that could be tweaked in there blocking and then the size or if you wanted to put a size you don't have to put a size limit on it that's a length limit you know I mean um, and, and one of the options there there is I think it was no size limit and then my last resort was the time frame you know so um, but I would appreciate if you guys change that to one of them options and be happy so well let me thank you for your input yeah. tonight again is just yep. a study session yep. where we're pulling in this information mm -hmm. okay. and uh, we will not be a decision made this evening okay all right thank you for thank all your you. work thank yeah. you thank you all right thank you does anyone else have any comments on it or no, when it comes to the size restriction, I understand, uh, but again, we got people that have short driveways, long driveways, and different size RVs. I think the main point, as long as the RV being stored in a driveway is not interfering with the street or sidewalk, yeah, the sidewalk. then I don't have a problem. And then maybe, I, w I would say safety sight distances too, because you don't want to be backing out of a driveway and you've got, you know, no sight distance. I, that's, I, I think I, a long ago, I remember somebody doing that. And they actually got hit coming out, and it was their own recreational vehicle that was blocking their view. So it's just just weird. Ga I know, just the yeah. gambit of stuff. So, but he even in the petition, he said that there were some site, you know, things too. If the vehicle is really, really large, too. I think the simplest thing to do would be just to take out that 72 hours, um, and if you were to leave in the restriction that it could not be within that setback can be within that front yard setback, so basically the first 25 feet, or the side yard setback, so that first six feet. That would take care of any sight distance issues. Mm -hmm. um, to put a, a length restriction on an RV, that's gonna be a little bit difficult to enforce too, and right. a little bit the same as the hours, yeah, and yeah. Yeah. Go, you know, it's, is this an 18 foot trailer or a 22 foot? You know, it's, exactly. that would be a little bit difficult. Um, the, the setbacks are a little bit easier to judge since we have GIS mapping and we can tell pretty accurately where those setbacks would lie. So that, that would be one mm -hmm. option that would, um, you know, take away that time restriction and, and still take care of the sight distance. I think the whole point of this, at least my point is, if the person has ample room to store it in the front for that length of time, then we don't want to do anything that's going to preclude who we can do it. Mm -hmm. for one clarification originally this was brought up for boating season i'm not sure that there is an rv season i think rv owner would make the could make the case that rv season is 12 months a year if you go south for the winter so um if there is a consensus tonight maybe a little direction on 
are we going to do this pursuing a April to October time frame, or are we going to look at what kind of uh, time restriction, considering I the differences between the I would still be in favor of the time frame. Mm -hmm. the Whatever the commission chooses this one. Because we do have ample lots in the city for long term storage mm -hmm. for the winters. And if the people need them during the winter, they can still pull them up in there, load them, mm -hmm. and uh, then go ahead and leave. Explain to me how the side uh, restriction works when they're parked on the side. What sure. Is, what does a six foot setback mean? Um, a six foot setback would be. Um, from your property line, that's but yeah, the I included a brochure from Gardner. I, I just liked yeah, their brochure. I thought that was a pretty good visual. Um, mm -hmm. Your side yard setback, it, it's six feet in most residential districts. So six feet in from your side property line. Um, so from that six feet between oh, that and your side. house. Yeah. From, okay, yeah. side. Is it from the front? From the from the front, it's generally twenty five feet. Um, okay. So negate any RV parked on the side anyway because we're from the front, from the yeah. mm -hmm. in, in those larger lots. You know there are a number of lots in town that have oh, pretty yeah. deep side yards and a number that have, as you mentioned, the pretty deep front yards. Mm -hmm. um, another they don't have that deeper front yard. If they put a side yard, but they they, they could have the side yard. Um, you mm -hmm. know we could put some sort of other depth restriction on the front yard that it couldn't be within 10 feet of a curb or, or something like that if you didn't want to have that full 25 foot. So there, there are some options that we could look at. Okay. Is there a consensus to have Julie draw up something yeah. where we can yeah. do you want yeah. to speak? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Part, okay. part of some options. I think we have enough. Go okay. You think you got enough to sure. carry on? Okay. I don't want to, I don't want you guys to lose the back. Come back up. Smaller vehicles be in time. You come back up to the podium. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. we're all there. <laughs> so. I just don't want it to get lost into the in, in the in the thing that you know the setback is fine in the back of the yard if you have room, but if you have smaller vehicles that can fit in the driveway, make sure that we you know they'd be able to do that too. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. I just don't want that to get lost in because we're no, you're looking at, at the side and the setback in the back because I'm looking at a lot of people don't have that. Right. They don't have something they no, can fit on the side. We're looking at the whole thing. We've got to look okay. at the whole thing. All right. I just know. I'm just being sure because. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's a consensus on one to have Julie and Paul work on that. Yep. Uh, item number two is the recreation program registration. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Good evening. The issues to review uh, late charges um, as they pertain to our late registration, so late fees for registrations come in after the deadline. Mm -hmm. Currently, the way uh, our operations are set up, we have a, a registration period uh, for our, our sports programs, you know, basketball, um, youth baseball and such, they generally last for about a month. And then after that month, then we have a, 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 a two-week stretch where you can still register your, your child to play, but we do uh, charge a $25 late fee at that point. Mm -hmm. reason we do that is to provide incentive to get registrations in in a, in a timely manner um, so that we can so that we can go on with, with uh, administering the program as far as setting teams and, and getting coaches and practices and order uniforms and all that kind of stuff. We used to in the past, after that two week period, have a drop dead deadline where at that point nobody could register further. Um, but if you recall it at uh, the city commission's uh, direction last year, I believe it was during our budget discussions, we discussed to go ahead and have a second, we call it the late, late fee, the late, late period, a second registration fee that allows for individuals to come into the program at any point, clear up through the last game of whatever the season may be. Mm -hmm. Just in case, we want to be as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, just in case somebody moves to the area and comes in right. in the middle of the season, something like that. Right. Is, is that one an additional $25? Yes. Yes. So they would have to pay fifty dollars. So that's a $50 technical late fee then. Right. right. And even having and no exceptions. Even right. allowing somebody to register after a late fee is pretty unheard of. We just did it for the couple instances that had come up and it was a commissioner who brought that up. Right. Yeah. Right. Most most entities have a a, a deadline. Right. And, they have a drop yeah. and then they have a, two weeks. Yeah. Like Lansing. Right. Sense. Two weeks later. If, if you're not in by then, too bad. So sad. Um, 
and we had the discussion. Well, you know what, you know what's because there are extenuating circumstances. People move in and out of the sure. community. Well, Kid mm -hmm. has a broken arm, gets his cast off. You know, right. it gives them the option. Yes, it it, it is uh, more costly at that point, but. It's more costly from an administrative point as well when we have to order more jerseys and you have to pay shipping on that, you know, on that alone. And of course, administration time that goes into it. Mm -hmm. So um, that is that is what we currently do. Uh, this comes before you tonight. We did have a concern. Citizen bring it to you. Um, so that's why we're at a study session. And I believe she is here tonight. Um, if you have any questions for myself, our sports program supervisor, Tabor Mandel, is also here tonight. If you have any questions regarding the administration of the programs, um, with that, if there's any discussion or any questions I might be able to answer. I've got a question for you, mm -hmm. How would you feel, I realize that you have an additional two weeks to allow for the $25 fee before you go into the additional $25. If, man, this is a very transient community, if somebody moves to this area within one month of your cutoff day to give them two weeks additional. I mean, it's be highly unusual for somebody to move in here in one day, run down to Parks and Rec and sign their kid up, if that's the cutoff day. Uh, but if we could give two weeks if they prove that they just moved to the area to allow them to without a fee. Otherwise, I think your fees Mm -hmm. And is is the fee arbitrary, or are there actual costs that 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 are incurred by Parks and Recs? That's I can't remember that. There are some additional costs. Um, like I said, uh, when when we order, like when we order uniforms, we order in bulk, right. and uh, they're cheaper in bulk. Obviously, we also pay shipping one time when we have to order additional ones. Do they add up to twenty five dollars? Probably not. Okay. Um, the $25 is, is there more as an incentive to, to, to try and get everybody in in a timely manner mm -hmm. so that we can go through the whole administrative portion of setting up teams, getting coaches, um, getting every, for, you know, for the skills test and getting everything organized. Um, it takes, takes quite a bit of in organization. In the last five years, how many late registrants have you had? We get a handful every year, not a lot. Um, I believe. About four or five years ago, this late fee was increased to 25, and it was before. It was while I was still over in park maintenance. Obviously, I believe they were, it was five or ten dollars at that time, and I believe the reason they changed it is because they had so many mm -hmm. late registrations coming in. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking with Marcella Williams, our administrative assistant, uh, earlier today about this, and she said it's, it's unbelievable the dif difference now as far as the. We still get some. You know, people people miss dates. Everybody misses dates. You know. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to have, you know, have things slip through the cracks. So it's, it's nice to have that we can still get them in, but it's nice to provide that incentive to get it in and to us in a timely manner. Tabor, you want to come up? If you don't mind, I'd like to address what you asked <coughs> about the people coming in because of the transient. Mm -hmm. And um, actually what happens is more often than not, we get a phone call from somebody who's in Georgia who's being transferred here and say, we'd like to register. We're not going to be um, coming in until... I'll give you a specific example. We've got a person coming in from somewhere. Um, they called way back when. I asked them if they would just send me an um, email that they'd be in such and such time. They're either going to be here the last week of December or the first week of January and I've got that on file and I guaranteed them that they would be able to pay the regular forty five or forty dollar fee mm -hmm. as opposed to having to pay the ninety. So I had that happen more often than I have people who come in and say, Oh, by the way we're here. So we address it that way. That's basically another way, another way to look at it. And I'm not picking on either group, but I would foresee the military for the ones that email me more than a basic civilian who has just moved to the area. And you know, in my five years, I've never had a civilian who's moved in and come in and asked if they could play basketball. That's the point, That's right. The point right? Yeah. yeah. So the people so, who I mean, affects the most. Our goal is to be fair to everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. As fair as we can. Exactly. Yeah. Without robbing. Yeah. And I think. I don't know what the rest of the commission feels like, but I think that 
that first two weeks, if uh, if they can prove that they just moved in, you know, let them let them go, let the kids have fun. That's what the whole idea of park and work is. Well, the late late one, I think that's overboard. I really do. I really do. I, I think honestly, if you're not having like a chronic problem anymore, I really think that we should eliminate that. Just reduce it to the initial twenty five. Yeah, I mean, a late fee is a late fee. It's twenty five dollars. You know, I mean, or I'd be even be open to, you know, if you want to, like, um, you know, you pay for the jersey and the shipping and, and, you know, and because, so you know, because you've, you know, you're late and we, you didn't get in on our bulk ordering or whatever. But, yeah, but, but two late fees is kind of crazy. Um, at least one. that That's, you know, or, you know, and I could dial that back a little bit because it's really not... It's not just covering our costs or anything in the program. It's you know I, I you know I just would you know rather have any costs that we're associated with or you know usually if you pay a late fee someplace you don't really pay as much as you do to sign up for the program. It's usually about half or something like that anywhere else in in the greater world on that. So you know and uh, you know like it you know. Like a ten dollar late fee or a fifteen dollar late fee or something like that. I mean, you know, I mean, our goal is, you know, we don't make money on these programs. They are taxpayer funded. They should be community friendly. You know, I mean, and you don't want people chronically taking advantage of the situation. I can understand that. And and if you needed to have it waived or something, if they could prove that they, you know, weren't here. I'd be flexible enough to say, you know, okay, you really want your kids into the program, you weren't here, if it's a, you know, a receipt of something, utility or something like that, you know, it's... Yeah, I, I agree with her. Make some, you know, and, and I think you can make exceptions sometimes, too. Everything doesn't have to be black and white. So. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I don't And that's at your discretion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like Tabor said, if, if somebody contacts us, like they're, they're right. coming yeah. in and out of right. and they contact right. us before the deadline. Um, and we've had that with our scholarship program. Yeah. They come in that, and it's the deadline, the day of, and they don't have the trade work they need. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, you came in by and, the deadline. And, you know, so you showed good faith effort, so you're in by the deadline. I know, and, and you got to applaud the parent that does that. I yeah. would not be that organized. <laughs> yeah. I think the $25 original late fee is fine. And then just have one, so I'm clear. And then that's just it, just one late yeah. fee that, go ahead, that yeah. goes ahead and runs through the entire yeah. program. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, I depend on what program there's to. There's also a point of where you're involved in the program that it's just not advantageous for the kid or the program to get in so late that they can't. And that's your discretion to deal with that because it's whatever, you know, you know, whatever sport and stuff that, that they're, you know, the kids are involved in because there's always another opportunity somewhere to participate. Yeah. Sure. I have no problem with the late fee uh, uh, for people who are procrastinating it and uh, just kick the can down the road, so to speak, and we know that we're all human and a lot of people do that, so I, I have no problem with late fee being there. And I think what you've done as far as anybody moving in the town, showing proof they've just moved in town, leaving the late fee, uh, late fee I think is a good idea. Um, so that's Honestly, that's kind of the bottom line with that. I'd have no problem with the late fee if people are living here and just took the time and didn't do it. You know, there's a late fee to get in, and it's that simple. Uh, but if they move the town, uh, waiving the fee to help them out, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's a good system. Is there anything you want to say? Yes. We need your name and your address. Sure. sure. Amy Phillips, 2926 Gerard Street in Leavenworth. Um, thank you so much on behalf of the parents for getting rid of the second week. That, that is truly a blessing to some of the families. And being a military spouse, knowing that we move, um, that's fantastic. So right. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is um, the $25 late fee and, and Ms. Weekly had mentioned lowering even that. Um, do consider that Lansing, that was mentioned, they have a $10 late fee. They do have a drop date once October 31st comes. Um, and I even have their paperwork. It's not black and white even then. They will take it on a case-by-case -case basis if your child can play basketball. But it's a $10 late fee. So $25, $10. 
Um, there really aren't any hard numbers to say that the $25 has greatly improved parents coming in. Uh, and, and, you know, we ha I think Steve mentioned they had two cases in the last how, maybe five years. I don't exactly remember what your numbers were. But you don't have a whole lot of people coming in late. So why $25? Why can't we be like our sister I, I don't city? That's what Steve said. I think he was right. mentioning the super late fee. Super yeah. late fee. We, we did go to 25 because we were at 10 and it was a problem. It wasn't, it wasn't an, an increase just to increase. It was an increase because there was a problem. Right. And, and I can't speak to Lansing's program, what problems they have or don't have. But there's a pretty good incentive in Lansing because if you don't get in that late fee, then you don't get in at all. There's a cutoff date, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, it, which is something we could do too. I mean, $10 and, a, and a, an absolute date. Um, the other thing that we don't have is we don't have an option to pay online. There's a well, lot of and, parents and, and, that, and we are working on. That. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, yeah. you know, to pay online, you may not have the $25 late fee at all because parents who work till five, six o'clock at night. They can't run down to pay in person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you set up a way f to make it easier where I can sit at home after work and click on my computer and pay, then we m might not even have to have this discussion. The late okay. fee would be a moot point. Good point. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, we're heading that way. That's <laughs> we can't wait either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can't either. You know, I mean, you know, yeah, we all we all have busy lives, and right. um, sure, but yes. does twenty five dollars have to be the penalty for having a busy life. I mean, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, and an absolute deadline. The commission voted not to have an absolute no. deadline, so okay. you would have to go back on something. Right, you just did. Right. Sure, sure. But please, please consider the twenty-five dollars as being something that is a burden to parents, um, and because we don't have the op the option to pay online yet, um, I just I think that's an unfair price. There should be a late fee, absolutely. I think we all are in agreement on that. But why can't we be like similar cities like Lansing, who only charges 10, or Wyandotte County, where they don't charge any at all? And I understand that their demographics are different in that county. But you know, you have parents here that $40 is that's what I can pay. And I, and well, sorry, I didn't have a chance to get down there on time. Oh, absolutely. Right, I just right. want you to consider all, sure. all, all of this before you say. You know, no, twenty-five dollars is the fee that it's going to be. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else on this one? Yes. Can I say one more thing? <clears throat> Just as an example, um, since we did away with the drop dead deadline, um, this year in basketball, we've already been practicing for a week. In that one week period. I had a parent come in and register their child, so I have to order their shirt then. Mm -hmm. We've already started practices, so the kid is put into a team light. Um, the very next day after I'd already ordered another shirt, another kid came in, and these are a lot more kids. Right. Had to go and order a shirt. Mm -hmm. Today, another child came in and paid. So I had to put in a third order of an individual shirt, which we have to pay full price of the shirt, full price for the printing, and the shipping three individual times in less than a week. Because I have no way, I can't wait so that I can get the shirt to the child. Yeah, you don't know if anybody else is coming. And I don't know if anybody yeah. else is coming. Yeah. Right, So right. that was the purpose when the commission decided to have no drop dead date the commission also said, go ahead and put another late fee on it at that time. Right. So that's the history of it. And that's the why, and that's an example this week of why mm -hmm. we did that. Okay. Yeah, but I'm also thinking if you're the household, too, that has more than one kid, you know, to it, that gets to be quite a, it's, it's prohibitive also then to even participate, too, if you've got more than one kid. I mean, you're paying right now currently just ninety dollars. You have multiply that by more than one child too. That's that gets to be excessive. I, I know you're trying to, you know, get rid of the abuse of the system there too. But mm -hmm. but yeah, I like I said, I'm I, I just I think the late late fee. I that's 
to me that's that's just too much still, you know, well, to do that. Instead of light fee law, you make it mandatory that if they come in and ready for light, that they have to pay what it costs to add that shirt print. Yeah, I shift and shift. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna tell you, twenty five dollars is pretty close to it because our shirt I would think in our bulk rate, our shirts are fourteen dollars. Right, but I understand and, doing yeah. onesies over our bulk rate. Mm -hmm. Well, but that was what the twenty-five dollars was covering was for that because then what? you had the shipping, and I don't know what mm -hmm. shipping is, but we're close to twenty dollars. Well, I did. That's why, because I, I, I even asked that. I said, um, I said, is it covering any costs of the program? So your twenty-five dollars is is almost covering the shirt and the shipping. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then that. Yeah. It, that should at least be what the late fee entails then is you're paying for the cost of right. the shirt yeah. yeah 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 okay well just give you a little time to maybe put something together and work with yeah. Paul and we'll look at it again. okay just for, for clarification on the one month that you spoke of mayor um, that's one month of moving within our the registration deadline date is that what, what well, we're looking at or the deadline is the 10th and they moved here okay. at the last of the month Okay. So they already got two weeks into it, but they hypothetically have been busy settling their home. Then that second two weeks is what I was referring to. Okay. We even go beyond, to be honest with you, and Steve probably doesn't know this, but we even go beyond that. I mean, okay. if a person shows that they've just moved in, yeah. I mean, why are we going to charge them a late? What are they late for? I mean, they they're just not moved late, here. they just got here. Yeah. Right. So how are they late? I mean, that's the way we've kind of looked at it. Is sure. They're not late because they just got here, and we go back to. And like I said, I use the example of the military person right. that's coming in. Sure, sure. And the last part, December first of January, and we told them, you know, we've even got a shirt ordered for the child because we know that. Then we wouldn't have any complaints here, right? What's that? <laughs> you're just saying right now that you're not you're not charging a late fee if they because I'm not having no, I'm not. I can order it in the bulk rate. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. I'm ordering it with the group, so it's already ordered for the person. Got it. Okay. Right. Work something up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number three is to review the code of ordinances for Chapter 18 animals. Harlan Fisher. Yes, sir. Okay, this is a review of um, Chapter 18, which covers animals. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of things in this chapter that we want to go over. I'll go over the first couple, and then I'll give it to um, Chief Kitchens to go over the last item. The first two, um, the first one covers adoptions of animals, and this really is kind of a housekeeping um, of a change that was made last year to the ordinance, and not all the changes that we intended to make got got made. So um, in looking at it, it was kind of, um, we, we came across that during the course of the year and it was one of the things that we were going to clean up. So the first item is um, on the attachments. There's a, there's a sentence under section 18-7A3 and the second sentence of that should have been eliminated, which says there's a penalty or violation of $25 for an animal or surrender to that um, animal shelter. And that should have been removed. So I'm just asking that um, you go ahead and, you know, when this comes back for an ordinance, that we should remove that because okay. that was intended um, with last year's. Um, the other thing on this section is um, we would like to add the provision for the police chief or the city manager to waive adoption fees as they seem, as they would deem it necessary. And I think, um, one of the situations this past year is we had a, an overabundance of cats, was right. that? <laughs> and uh, we wanted to be able to give those, get um, rid of them. Yeah. Rid of them. <laughs> and um, more Some of an incentive. the private entities are, are allowed to do that, but they have a big push for adoptions. They say, hey, come in. And, and, and so I guess it's in, in, in an effort to be a little more competitive. Um, where we just want the opportunity once in a while to do that to, <coughs> to incentivize coming down for adoptions. So okay. good. Yeah. So we would ask that when this comes back, we would add that um, that section there. The next one is on kennels, um, and again, this is one of those things where, as we read the um, the ordinance, it doesn't really clearly um, state the purpose of it. It doesn't define what a commercial kennel is and what a residential kennel is. Um, 
I guess some years back, we kind of got away from the city um, regulating commercial kennels, and we've left that to the state to license them, to inspect them, and that type of thing. So our ordinance doesn't really separate those two very well. So we just kind of went through and cleaned up the, um, put in some stuff that would clean that up and would clarify that a little bit more. We put in the de definition of what a commercial kennel is. Um, and then throughout the ordinance, we put in whether that particular section was talking about a commercial kennel or a residential kennel. So basically those things would just um, <clears throat> clarify that if it is a residential kennel, which is anybody that has more than four animals, animals and there's some combinations of cats and dogs, um, that animal control, the city would license those, would inspect them and take care of that. Um, and then on the commercial side, commercial kennel, then this, those would be um, um, permitted by the state. So those two things we, we just want to kind of clar clarify. Um, and then there's some other parts of it as far as the um, fees that I'll talk about when we get to the. I have a, I have a question. When in red you put in here the definition of a commercial kennel, mm -hmm. it almost reads the same as a residential kennel. Yeah. Sure. The difference is, Commissioner Weekly, uh, let's compare local with ranch, which is a business, and in yeah, order so to open a business, you have to be zoned appropriately for mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And so that's essentially what the difference should be. And that was our effort to reflect that. Um, you know, those are businesses, and you have to be zoned appropriately. We wouldn't want one of those opened up in a uh, presidential neighborhood. Okay, okay. okay. Um, versus a, a person who might breed dogs and may have eight dogs for a period of time okay. until they're sold off or, mm -hmm. or that sort of thing. Those are allowable, but that's what we made an effort to sort of differentiate. And that's a residential, that comes under residential camp. Correct. Okay, okay. Just, yeah, I was just, yeah, okay, just, all right, wanted to make sense. Because, yeah, in the commercial, it doesn't, well, it doesn't really state anything in there about zoning or anything, but that's covered in some, I just answered my own question, never mind. <laughs> sorry about that, guys, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. Okay, all right, no, good, okay. <laughs> the next big effort, um, folks, um, is domestic foul. Uh, the animal control staff, our supervisors, informed me that in the course of probably the last year or so, we have been you know, getting a growing number of residents in the city that have chickens that produce eggs. Um, uh, there's a number, um, we've gotten sort of two different compl complaints. They call, folks call and say, hey, what are the rules about chickens? We'd like to get chickens and we'd like to start down that road. And what are the rules? And then we get the opposite of that. Hey, what's the rules on chickens? How many are you supposed to have? And what's the number? And that sort of thing. Right now, there is no number on uh, whether you can do that. Uh, there's a couple of rules. One, if you have them in your residential neighborhood, you're required to have at least 75 feet from the coop, if, if you will, to the neighbor's yard. Um, and then also, in addition to that, we've gotten a few complaints and, and a growing number of complaints about roosters. Uh, roosters do what they do at somewhere around 4 or 4, 35 o'clock in the morning. They wake up everybody in the surrounding uh, neighborhood, uh, whether it's Saturday morning or not. And so we started to get a little bit of uh, a little bit of concern about that from our community. So uh, essentially, my question to you tonight is very simple. Would you like us to consider uh, imposing some sort of number on uh, chickens? Uh, we looked around in the community. Most cities allow it and still allow you to have chickens in the city, but they do, you know, some anywhere from six to ten. Um, I'm not sure that we would want somebody in the city of Lenworth to own 50. I guess they could or not. Um, you know, unless you, you want us to do that, that's fine. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's really. More yeah. Like a business um, exactly. Uh, in any event, um, you have whatever authority you would like to impose whatever number you think is reasonable. I don't think they should be running at large. Right. This summer I almost ran over a chicken. Right. Picking um, up my dog. <laughs> we, we, uh, we do occasionally have that, uh, where we sort of deal with that on a case by case basis. Yeah. But um, anyway, uh, it is kind of a growing issue. We've started to get uh, less client the animal control supervisor. Uh, thinks there's about 25 or so houses that we know of that have chickens, and, mm -hmm. and there's no, right, um, and again, there's no number, and so whatever you might 
out of those 25 that do you know of the half chickens what do you think is uh, the count is the biggest one uh, I would say there's some that have more than 10 um, and that, that, that is a number that kind of just jumps out at me mm -hmm. that might seem to be reasonable I don't want to okay. yeah. I'd like to see what other cities do okay. yeah because this where I ran over this chicken it was a really small yard and, and, and it you know was in the alley and right. like I said and I was like and it, and it was the rooster so I mean <laughs> it's just kind of think of it now yeah that could have been really bad um, but this this was a really small yard and and I, I saw two others so ten for that size of a yard would really be a bad smell downwind when the summer hit there a little little more so yeah I, I need more information <laughs> They do make good fertilizer. They do, well, yeah, but until, yeah, as long yeah. as the wind's not in that direction, yeah. yeah there, is, there is language in the ordinance that requires cleanliness and the right. ordinance. Yeah. So we do have that. Okay. And there is the 75 foot rule. There okay. just isn't a number. So right. I suppose yeah. the question is, or what I would be looking for relative to that is, is there consensus to move forward to try to identify what a good number would be? Yes. Yeah. We can come up with uh, what other cities do. I, I, I don't know. I have relatives that, that have raised chickens and roosters and all sorts of things like that and I'm not sure I know around the nation but here in Leavenworth I believe a hen laying chicken can probably lay an egg about once every two to three days so if you're looking at a family that wants a couple dozen of eggs to go through a week without having to go to the store and all that uh, if we're going through the count we're going through now I would say 10 would uh, to me off the cuff you know without further study I would say 10 would be a decent limit for inside the city because with 10 chickens you should be able to produce over well over a dozen to two dozen eggs a week which again if you're a family of two three four people that should be keep you from having to go to the store and as far as the roosters i can turn about the rooster noise i really do but again uh, for those yeah well not only that but if, if you think you've got a problem with with uh, chickens running out of the yard now take the rooster out of the hen house and see how far those chickens run because the roosters keep them there they they, they go back the pen at night with the rooster being there for protection as well as you know uh, their housing so without the rooster you're going to have more chickens running at large if you remove that so um unless of course you got a fenced in yard you know but then again chickens are going to go over the fence so yeah 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 that i can go with one rooster well, right you, yeah you, we limit the square feet of so many dogs like that why wouldn't you do the same right. thing for right. chickens on that so so over the course of maybe the next two weeks before we bring this back, I'll send you some information. I'll email that to you and get that to you so you okay. can kind of get a sense from what other communities are doing. And then we took a, a sort of brief look, and um, most do allow it. There are some caps, and they're pretty all over the place, but I'll get that to you soon. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you required to have a chicken coop? Not exactly. You're required to have some mechanism by which you contain them, but I don't think you're required to have it. Yeah, because I was just—it said all—it says all pens, yards, and barns, but but this little house that I went by—it's not exactly room for a barn out there. <laughs> I don't think the ordinance says anything. It just says that they can't run at large, and they and then it talks about whatever contains them, how close it can be to another structure. Right. Okay, so but they should have, have, a, have a coop. But yeah. it does right. kind of insinuate yeah. that they have to be. Right. Some kind of right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, if I only own one or two chickens, I don't need a huge coop. I can, yeah. you know, incorporate a doghouse and rebuild it for that purpose. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. I'll get that to you. Oh, and chickens. <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't. It's, it does address it, but you, you can't have it. Yeah. It's unlawful for others. Uh, my, my, Mike and Mike. Yeah, because someone had a goat one time. I don't know why they had it. They all had to go. Okay. All right. Go for all right. She's all yours. Mm -hmm. All right. I have, um, yeah, two minutes. I can go. <laughs> go. The, uh, <laughs> as you know, we've been, uh, been talking for uh, some time uh, about uh, stormwater. Uh, and how we manage it in the city of Leavenworth. <coughs> and as a result of the EPA inspection a few years ago, we started about a year and a half ago with a uh, permit process for what we are calling the land disturbance permits. 
where if you are building something or disturbing the earth or uh, doing any sort of thing that might cause erosion, you're required to obtain a permit uh, to prevent erosion, uh, keep some records and such. And we established the program about a year and a half ago. There was no fee associated with that. And we've worked with the developers and the contractors and such to see uh, how our permitting process can be improved and uh, information exchanged. And uh, we thought it was a time probably to uh, bring it to the commission with some recommendations for a more formal structure than we've had. Uh, we had a meeting with uh, pretty much everyone. We sent notice to pretty much everyone that might have got a permit in that time period to come talk to us uh, informally uh, here in, in the commission room of, about what they thought of the program. We informed them of some of the changes we'll talk about here this evening and if they had any comments, questions, or concerns. And we had maybe 20 people here and really there was no uh, comments, concerns, or questions, which I don't know how that could possibly happen, but, <laughs> but, but it did. You just made a very good presentation. I, I, I'm assuming that was the, a lot of information. Was the answer. <laughs> So, uh, Mike Hooper has worked uh, very closely with uh, Hal Burdett, our chief building inspector, to kind of develop uh, the process and procedures. Uh, we kind of have two things that get looked at. One is the street right away public work side of things, and the other is kind of managed by the building inspectors or their building houses or that sort of thing. So, but it's the same set of regulations. And Mike's put together uh, what you have here this evening, uh, which is kind of the draft uh, ordinances. And there's some uh, things we still need to change on, on as we go along. But basically, uh, it kind of outlines what are the activities that require a permit, what are the requirements for submitting an application. And honestly, most applications, we work with the uh, contractor and filling it out in the office. We can print a picture off of the aerial photos and they can draw and mark what it is. We don't, we don't believe it's onerous. Uh, inspection uh, requirements, what do you have to do as a permit holder? It basically, it's the federal and state guidelines, which is essentially federal and state rules, that you have to inspect your erosion control once a week and make a record that you, in fact, inspected it. And we're bound to inspect it periodically as well and check that you have records and say that you inspect it. <laughs> so this talks a little bit about that and it creates a, a fee structure and a penalty structure. Um, the uh, fee structure, uh, another wrinkle in here is if it's a one acre or a larger site, there's a state permit that's required. It's called a notice of intent to discharge construction water. In a, in a, somewhere in the state of Kansas. And there's a much more complex series of requirements that go with that, that uh, we work with people that are required to get those to make sure their requirements meet our needs. But most contractors, engineers, and such know how to, how to do that. On the smaller permits, uh, it's proposed that uh, up to uh, single, family, single family homes, there would not be a fee required for that. There's, they're, they're, we're proposing that there would be a bonding requirement related to cleaning up the mud and that sort of thing, but there's no actual permit fee of, uh, say, $150 or something like that for a stormwater permit fee. And I think that covers most of the folks that come in and they're, uh, they're building an individual house or adding a garage on somewhere. Uh, if they take basic erosion control measures, they, take our picture, we draw a plan and say this is uh, straw hay bales and this is erosion control fence and it'll protect the gutter from mud. It solves 90% of those problems. Okay. The larger developments where we're wanting to put a fee on there because we do have uh, responsibilities and we do have problems. Take the, the St. Mary College project. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a tough one for them to keep up with and a tough one for us to monitor. Uh, they kind of had most of it right, but the part that wasn't right every time it rained that year, it was just mud from one end of Hughes Road to the other. Mm -hmm. And we want some teeth in the ordinance. We spent a lot of time working with them. So we've created an, uh, a permit fee for those large projects as well as penalties. Ultimately, it's uh, the ordinance as it's structured allows the city to go take care of the problem and build, build them back 
uh, it allows us to uh, notify them that we've got to fix it within 48 hours. However, this part we got to fix within four hours. Otherwise, we will or we can take emergency action and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like if there's mud flowing in front of someone's driveway or something. I know we've had cases like that with construction next door and yeah. Yeah, and it, it has been a problem. Uh, not so much lately. I think people are kind of getting the hang of what our expectations are. But uh, Mike has worked uh, long and hard to put together this, uh, this draft uh, set of ordinances and the fee structure that goes with it. On page 18 of the agenda, it kind of talks about the, uh, uh, the fee structure. And if you are uh, disturbing something of an acre or larger, our uh, minimum fee is $150 for us to uh, issue you a permit and if you're going on uh, uh, five houses or, or more it's two hundred and fifty dollars for like a large subdivision under a single single developer like uh, Shenandoah would have been uh, most of those homes were built by the uh, by the same the same group of right. people and they could have just gotten one permit to deal with it all Another thing that we found was uh, utility companies often prepare uh, a statewide permit they will, and they have all their paperwork in order and we were for a time making them every time they wanted to do anything they had to do a certain level of paperwork. We thought uh, that's actually pretty silly. And so we are creating, uh, if, if they can bring in a statewide permit and agree to abide by the rules that uh, we would not assess them a permit fee for pretty much any of their work that falls into that 100 square foot area or which is like 99 percent of the things that they do for mm -hmm. like the gas company or the uh, electric company they do small things unless unless it's a really big thing in which case they have to get a separate permit uh, we the bonding is outlined in here um, and it is proposed if you are a single family home that you would have a um, I think it was 20, close to $2,500 bond for uh, potential uh, mud, uh, mud costs. Uh, that is uh, not a, that's not a permit fee, that is, is a bond to cover, uh, whatever you want to cover, work it out with the bonding company. And then uh, there's some other language in here about uh, who's considered a responsible party, uh, basically uh, sending notices from the homeowner on down to the contractors considering notification of people that should be in a position to act responsibly. So this is the draft ordinance. There's a couple of wonky paragraphs in here where I think if you're going to, you're going to build a garden shed, you have to have an erosion control prepared by an engineer. Now that's not appropriate for that section. We're going to, we're going to fix that. Uh, and we tried to, we tried to make it simple, but when you start condensing things, you kind of lose track of where it came from. Well, Mike, I've got a real silly question. Certainly, sir. What about a garden? Garden? Um, I, I'm just going to bring it up. The state doesn't want it, to I think it's agriculture. Interestingly enough, uh, agriculture is totally exempt from our regulations unless they are posing a direct threat to the water. I don't even know. So, <laughs> the other question I've got, you're just referencing single family residents. Is the fees higher for duplex, fourplex, sixplex? They would actually be the same. Be the same. Yeah. yeah. One okay. duplex building would be considered single family. Yeah, two, like two to one yeah. part of it because it's one structure. Okay. Yeah. Two to two to five single family residences was a permit fee of one hundred fifty dollars for that group, and then two fifty for more than five. The fee structure is shown on page 29 uh, and the next agenda item is adopting and talking about the fee structure. This would be the structure that we're proposing to be uh, adopted. Did I miss anything? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did have a look at the, the ordinances of about five other cities compared to what we're proposing, which is actually less than what the other cities have in place currently. Uh, as far as permit fees as well as bonding. Uh, so I think we're being fair to our residents and our builders and everything here. Okay. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? No. Mm -hmm. 
No, it looks yeah. looks yeah. pretty good. This was definitely something the EPA wanted to see, a formalization of the program. So I'm glad we got that done. I think we'll be very happy with that. So I know that I think everybody's following the rules pretty good because they're digging what's going on. Yeah. It's got the uh, fence up or straw bales or this new tubing. Mm -hmm. It took a little work in the beginning, staying on them and, and reminding them that they've yeah, we, and I yeah, noticed that's a good job. job. Yeah. The mud on the trees. It, it really has, and it, yeah. it's been a pretty impressive shift by uh, people. I thought it would be a more difficult transition than it was, and I was very happy with people taking it seriously. Good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll move on to number five, which is review the annual permit and license. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This is the annual review of Appendix F, which is the um, fees for the city. Um, the code does require that we uh, look at that at least once a year to see if there's anything. Um, staff isn't proposing any changes to current fees. It's just the ones that we're adding for the land disturbance and then those ones that are just those administrative things that we needed to make some changes to. So um, the first change and um, it's page two of the fee schedule. Um, it would just be to strike. It shouldn't say adoption service fee. It should say, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it should say animal surrender fee. And so there's just changing some wording on there that wasn't quite right. Mm -hmm. um, on the next page, um, the impoundment charges, dog running at large, and a cash bond. Again, that was one of those things last year that we um, removed the cash bond or the deposit that somebody put down if they adopted a dog, and we just um, overlooked getting that taken out of there. The next item down there is just putting the word residential kennel permit, since that's the only kind of permit that we um, uh, we issue here in the city. And I'm sorry, I forgot. I missed the one at the top of the page. Again. Um, the adoption fees are the costs that are incurred by the city. Um, Animal Control does a, a contract with um, vet services and stuff like that. So whatever the cost of um, uh, those fees incurred for that animal is what the person pays. It's not a, a straight um, fee. Um, and then... on page eight of the fee schedule. Um, in, in looking, going through and looking at some of these, um, I noticed that the alarm company um, late installation notification fee, it was listed as $35. And in the within the code itself, most of the time it says reference the um, appendix F. This one actually says within the code it's $25. And I couldn't find where that was ever changed. Um, so I think the proper thing to do is go with the 25 because I couldn't see where it ever came to the City Commission it was raised to $35. So since there was a conflict between the two, I think the 25 is probably the appropriate amount that we should have in there. And then um, adding the fees for the land disturbance that um, Mike and Mike discussed. Yeah. So okay. those are the only things that staff would propose. Um, I don't know if the commission had a chance to look at the other fees and if there were any others that they had concerns about that they thought may needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any comments or no. concerns about the license fees? So just come back as an ordinance then. Okay. Well, thanks, Paul. All right. Moving on, we have a need for a uh, special meeting. I need a motion first. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. We can vote with Commissioner Wayne. Aye. 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 We are in a special meeting. Uh, this will be the appointment to Lovemore County Port Authority. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Commission, um, yesterday the Leavenworth County uh, Commission unanimously m voted to reappoint Teresa Comerford to a new term commencing January 1st, 2017 to the Port Authority and to appoint Bob Patswald to fill the unexpired term of Terry Andrews, who has resigned for the board um, to Leavenworth County Port Authority. How this works is either body can approve, but then the other body has to confirm. So uh, tonight before you is um, to vote to Confirm the county units will be reappointing Teresa Comerford uh, for a full four-year term and to appoint Bob Patswell to fill the unexpired term of Terry Andrews. Second. 
Terry spent quite a few years on the board. I think he needs to be complimented. He is, and we're going to definitely time. work on uh, making sure that he is properly thanked for his service yeah. to the board. He's, I think, uh, since I think the early 70s, he was, he's uh, been on the board. So. Mm -hmm. Is there any objections to the two people? No objection. Is there a motion? I would move uh, that we appoint Teresa Comerford, re reappoint her mm -hmm. to the Port Authority Board and to appoint uh, Robert Patswell to the um, to replace Terry Andrews. Second. We have a motion and a second again with Commissioner Hooper. Aye. 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 Okay, our next is uh, Resolution B-2155. That's authorizing the public sale of taxable general improvement bonds. Okay, this um, is the resolution for the public sale of the taxable general, general obligation bond series 2017A for the industrial park project. Um, on September um, 13th, the City Commission adopted Home Rule Ordinance Number 8011, authorizing the issuance of general obligation bonds in the maximum principal amount of $5 million to finance the City's share of the estimated cost of the industrial park. Um, and then on November 22nd, the interlocal agreement was approved between the City Commission, the um, Leavenworth County, and Leavenworth County Port Authority. The um, cost share to the city and the county was split 50-50 at a share of a cost for each for $4,821,942.50. Um, the city's portion will be financed through the issuance of the, these bonds, 2017A, in an estimated amount of $4,910,000. That includes um, any issuance costs and interest on those. Um, they will be dated February 1st, 2017, and they'll have a 19-year maturity date on them. The public sale of the bonds will take place on Tuesday, January 10th at 11 o'clock Central Time, and we will, um, per the ordinance, or I'm sorry, resolution, put the notice um, as required and published in the Leavenworth Times in the Kansas Register. Um, let's see. Um, the principal and interest on the bonds will be paid from the countywide sales tax fund as proposed in the CIP and the first payment would be due in um, 2018. So this resolution is just um, setting the, the date and it's just kind of one of the, well, it's the second step in it and then we'll have the ordinance at the time that um, the bonds are so you know, we'll come back to you for approval of that. So. Okay. okay. Any questions by the commission? No. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? I move that we approve resolution B 2155 authorizing the public sale of the taxable general obligation bond series 2017-A for the industrial park. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. <laughs> Aye. 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 That passes four to zero. A motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Aye. 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 We are adjourned.